Hello, <clears throat> this lesson is intended to show the derivation of Beer's Law. So Beer's Law is defined as the absorbance is equal to the extinction coefficient times the concentration times the path length. Um, We'll get more into that later. I just wanted to give you an overview of Beer's Law. Some key terms that you will need to understand are the absorbance, the concentration, the power, path length. Path length sometimes is denoted as L or B. I'll be using B today. The extinction coefficient. Uh, today I'll be using epsilon and the constant of proportionality. So some prerequisites for Beer's law. Number one, the absorbers must act independently of each other. Two, the absorbing medium must be fully diluted in the interactive volume. So it must be fully diluted, it must be a solution. Uh, three, the absorbing medium must not scatter the radiation. So there should be no, no turbidity. So the solutions should be flat, um, should be at ease, should be calm. For the incident radiation must consist of a parallel rays, each traversing the same length in the absorbing medium. So you want to make sure that the light entering the medium, all of it is uh, parallel and it passes through the same amount of the absorbing medium. Five, incident radiation should preferably be monochromatic or at least have a width that is more narrow than the absorbing transition. And six, the incident flux should only act as a non-invasive probe of the species under study. So, if you have these conditions fulfilled, Beer's Law will hold, and if they are not fulfilled, then there will be deviations from Beer's Law. So here's a little description of what goes on in Beer's Law. Uh, the decrease in power, dp, is proportional to the incident power, p0, the concentration of the absorbance species, C, and the thickness of the section, DX. You can see that I have a little diagram here that shows the initial power, P0, um, the absorbing medium is this entire rectangular shape, and you can see that the yellow rectangular bars in this medium decrease. That's uh, to indicate the decrease in power. Um, the little dots in here indicate the concentration in the absorbing medium. So um, we have that. We have X naught, which is the start of the path length and x which is the ending path length and we have dx which is the change in the path length all right so here the change in path length is just one of these rectangular shapes all right so Again, decrease in power is inversely proportional 
to the initial power times the constant of proportionality, the concentration, and the path length. So here we have 0 to 25 percent of the power being absorbed or of the path length. Then we have 26 to 50 percent of the path traveled in this section then 51 to 75 percent and then 76 to 100 percent. More description. The decrease in power is proportional to the incident power, the concentration of the absorbent species, and the thickness of the section. So obviously I'm trying to get this to be extremely clear because it will be extremely important going forward. All right, so beta is the constant of proportionality and the minus sign indicates a decrease in power, p, as x increases. Remember x is our path length. The rationale for saying that the decrease in power is proportional to the incident power may be described by a numerical example. If you start off with 100 incident photons and lose 2, okay, how many photons would you lose if you started off with 200 photons and everything else is a constant? Think about it for a while. Well, you have twice as many photons to begin with, so you'll absorb twice as many photons at the end. So you start off with 100 the first time, you lost 2, so 2 times 100 is 2, so 2 times 2 is 4. Let's see. And sure enough, we lose 4 photons of 200. That's supposed to be 200, not 2,000. Okay, let's continue. We have a little... Uh, visual here that we can do to picture what's going on. If we have, say, team photon versus team particle, we can use some volunteers. Um, we start off with team photon having four players and team particle having two players. So as team photon makes its way through the playing field, each time it interacts with team particle, a player from team particle, it's stopped in the medium. So initially, if there are four photons and two particles, we can see that it is likely that some of the photons will make it through the playing field. Now as we move down uh, in concentration, we'll see that the concentration of particles increase. So as we increase uh, our concentration, then the concentration increases, but the photons do not increase. So again, if the photons are the same in number and attempt to make their way through the field, through the medium, then it is more likely that Photons, the photons will be absorbed in this concentration. And in scenario three, uh, concentration three, if the photons try to make it through this medium, you can see that it is even more likely that the photons will be absorbed. So we can see from the previous example that if the number of particles increase, that is, the solution becomes more concentrated, the solution does a better job of stopping the photons. That is, the absorbance increases. Now, let's see how Beer's law is derived using these concepts. So, let's start off with our original equation. Decrease in power, change in power, is inversely proportional to the constant of proportionality, the initial power, 
the concentration and the path length. Using some algebra, we can rearrange our equation uh, dividing both sides by negative p, and we end up with this equation. Uh, negative change in power over power, over the initial power, is equal to the constant of proportionality times the path length. Remember, these are two constants times the path length, okay? So let's set up our integration on both sides of this equation. The limits of integration are p naught at initial power at p naught and the initial path length at x equals zero and the finishing power p at p and at x equals b. So here we've set up our integration. This is our main equation. We have our initial power. We're integrating from our initial power to our remaining power. Okay, the change in power over the initial power. We put the negative sign on the outside of our integrand. And we have our constants, the constant of proportionality and the path length, or the concentration, outside of our, our integration um, for our path length over the range from 0 to b dx. So we can see that p naught is our incident power. x equals 0 is the start of our sample. p equals p is the remaining power. And x equals b is the end of our sample. So on this page, we will deal with the right side of the main equation. So let's work with this. We have our constant of proportionality and our concentration integrated over 0 to b dx. So if we are going to integrate this, we can see that we leave our constants on the outside of the integrand and we have, we're going to be integrating from 0 to b. There is a 1 in front of this dx. Now, remember that if we raise any variable to the 0 power, then it is equal to 1. So here we have x to the 0 power dx. We're integrating from 0 to b, x to the 0 power dx. So let's consider the inside portion of this integral. Here's a reminder. The integral power rule says that if we're integrating xn dx, then that is equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c for n not equal to negative 1. Right? So integrating from 0 to b, x to the 0 power dx, we get, just doing the math here, x to the 0 power plus 1 over 0 plus 1 is equal to x to the first power over 1, which is simply equal to x. Okay. Now here's another reminder. The fundamental theorem of calculus says that if you're integrating over the range a to b, f of x dx, then the integral, integrand of f of b minus f of a. When we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, we get this equation here. We have our constants on the outside of our integral um, over the range from 0 to b, x naught um, dx. And when that is worked out, we have our constants 
times x over the range from a 0 to b. Just working out our calculations, we substitute in b for b in this side of the equation and 0 for a, right? So we have b minus a and we are left with the constant of proportionality times the path length times b. So that finishes our right side of the main equation. So let's work with the left side of the main equation. Right? Here's a reminder. If we are integrating 1 over x dx, that is equal to the natural log of x plus c. So ln x plus c. So here we have, we're integrating p naught to p, the dp over p. So it's like we have 1 over p here, like we have 1 over x here. And in that case, we're going to use the natural log of p, but we have to remember that there's a negative in front of our integral, so we have to bring our negative with us over the range from p naught to p. Now let's just plug in what we remembered before about the fundamental theorem of calculus over the range from p naught to p. We plug those in. We have negative natural log of p minus the negative natural log of p naught and we have a double negative here so that is equal to the negative natural log of p plus the natural log of p naught and remember that if we have a negative natural log that is the same as putting that natural that variable being impacted by the negative natural log in the denominator. So we have the negative natural log of p naught over p. Putting these back together, we just reunite what we've done for both the right and the left side of our equations and end up with this equation the negative natural log of p naught over p is equal to the constant of proportionality times the constant times the path length. This is what we get when we have solved both sides of the main equation. So here's our conclusion. The natural log of p naught over p is equal to the constant of proportionality times the path length times the concentration. Now finally converting the natural log into log using the relationship the natural log of z is equal to the natural log of 10 log z gives Beer's law. So we change the natural log into the natural log of 10 but then we divide it by the natural log of 10. Uh, so we have the log of p naught over p, that's going to be the absorbance, is equal to the constant of proportionality divided by the natural log of 10 times the concentration times the path length. And this constant of proportionality over the natural log of 10 is our epsilon or our extinction coefficient. And so here we go with Beer's Law. Our absorbance is equal to our extinction coefficient times our concentration times our path length. All right? Now Beer's Law says that there is a linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. Let's see how the slope intercept formula of a line relates to Beer's law. So our equation of a line says that y equals mx plus b. Right? From 
these equations, we can see that y is equal to the absorbance. Our slope is equal to our extinction coefficient times our path length. And our variable, our independent variable is going to be our concentration. So as we change our concentration, there, if you could see me right now, I'm moving my hand up and down, as we change our concentration, we're also going to be changing our absorbance up and down. And initially, the y-intercept is zero, so it is not described on Beer's law. For these equations, we can see that there is a linear relationship between the concentration and the absorbance. This is one of the fundamental concepts communicated in Beer's law and why it is so very useful. So how is Beer's law used today in science? Well, we're using it in our science uh, research over the summer. But Beer's Law is also used to find out whether or, not, whether or not athletes are using a banned substances. The absorbance of their blood should fall within a certain range. When the absorbance of their blood sample falls out of that range, the testers can infer that there is an excess concentration or a diminished concentration of a particular substance in the athlete's blood due to the rela linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. In short, it is used to find out whether or not athletes are doping. And I have a picture of someone doing a time trial for the Tour de France because of all the scandal that has gone on with doping and the Tour de France and the many other sports for that matter. So I hope that this has been helpful, a helpful review for the understanding of derivation of Beer's Law and how it relates to what we are researching this summer and math. Thank you very much.